Hello again. This is your COVID-19 field trip crew arriving at the wildlife refuge at Ritidian, or Lidikchen as the Chamorros call it. On the way there, we stopped at the overlook on top of the cliff, hoping to see Rota 30 miles away on the horizon, but there was too much haze. The refuge has two lati sites, a cave with pictographs, nature trails, a nature centre and a spectacular beach, but dangerous for swimming. In May 2020, the Navy agreed to build a new access road and headquarters for the Park Service and the USGS Snake Research Lab, out of the way of the firing range that is already under construction. Hi, I'm Maribel Kinata and I'm a park ranger here at the Guam National Wildlife Refuge. We got a special tour from Mary Bell Kinata because the refuge was still officially closed at the time. She took us first to see a lati site at the east end of the beach. It's a fairly open woodland of mostly native trees with level ground of limestone cobbles. You may notice that Mary Bell pauses as she approaches the ancient site. She said a short invocation of respect to Gwela Jengwelo, the ancestors. There is an interpretive sign that shows how the house would have looked. The Lati period was from 800 up to 1521 AD when the Spanish arrived, but there were settlements at Latikian before that, in the pre-Lati period from 1 to 800 AD, and before that, back to 1500 BC. This area was thus occupied for over some 3,000 years. While we were there, Mary Bell pulled some weeds off a fallen capstone to reveal some pottery sherds. There are lots of pot sherds scattered about. All cultural artefacts are protected by Guam law, of course. This pot sherd is a fragment of corded pottery, and the black specks of volcanic rock in it date it to the Lati period. Mary Bell reminded us that the coastline has changed over the millennia, as this map shows. The ancient shoreline was very close to the cliffs when people first arrived about 1500 BC, and it gradually moved out as the island was lifted up. The settlements on this map are only up to AD 1, so the Lati site we are visiting is not shown, but it was probably near the 700 BC to 1 AD shoreline, shown by the dotted line. The forest here is considered strand forest and has the more salt tolerant species that also occur in limestone forest. Strand vegetation used to be important nesting areas for seabirds before their decline. Now seabirds can only be seen on Cocos Island. We saw Fargo, first the populations of saplings, then the beetle nut like fruit, and looking up the parent trees as well as Puting, the fish kill tree with its bat pollinated flowers and pyramidal fruit, and the native cycad, most as here showing the impact of the Olacapsus scale, but a few healthy specimens like this one. Nonac or Hernandia is a large tree in the strand and backstrand forest with heart-shaped leaves that are rather reminiscent of pago leaves, but the flowers are small and occur in clusters, and the fruit is also very different from pago in being small and black. It looks like a seed, developed within an open globular cup made up of bracts, so not technically part of the fruit. Another large tree in the strand is Pisonia grandis, on many atolls it forms single species forests and is an important seabird nesting tree, which we saw on a visit to Heron Island Research Station on the Great Barrier Reef, Australia. The birds in these photos are white-capped noddies and an egret chick. The noddies drape leaves over branch points on the trunk to make their nests, gluing them together with their droppings. This pair is building in a plumeria tree right next to the mess hall but they are using Pisonia leaves. The male brings and offers a leaf. The female decides whether she likes it. The tree has a nasty trick to help it get nutrients, as explained in this interpretive sign. The sticky fruiting branches trap the birds that die and decompose, enriching the soil. On Guam, noddies, brown noddies in our case, now nest only on offshore islets, 
such as Cocos and Anai, because the brown tree snake cannot swim across to them. We went back along the beach, where we again saw the strand vegetation of Hunic and Nanasso, as at Hilan, but this time with pandanus behind it rather than a coconut zone. But elsewhere in the refuge there are old coconut plantations. Mary Bell showed us a place she called a shark nursery, but with the water surface chopped up by the wind it was hard to see if there were actually any sharks there. We also looked at some bird and hermit crab tracks in the undisturbed sand. And a place where there was a turtle nest. We've come back now to the nature trail near the nature centre, which goes over to the base of the cliff and along to a cave. It's similar vegetation as before, perhaps more like backstrand grading into limestone forest. There's more soil and ferns. Here we can see roots coming down from the cliff high above, reaching for groundwater in the aquifer. This characteristic is advantageous to plants that grow on limestone, which does not hold water. This cave is dry, which is to say that the bottom of it is still above groundwater level. Shelters like this would have been useful to the ancient Chamorros during typhoons, and there are other caves nearby that do have water, but none as big as Paget. In some of the caves at Litegen, there are pictographs, handprints, and calendars, and these can be visited, accompanied by a guide, of course. We walk through the keyhole tunnel. There was some very exciting environmental news earlier this summer. A group of scientists in Europe had worked out that our monitor lizard is an endemic species. It had been described from Saipan in 1929 by Japanese scientist Kishida in an obscure journal as Varanus tsukamotoi, but it was later rejected as a new species and lumped in with the widespread Varanus indica. A study published in May showed that Kishida was right, and it is an endemic species in the southern Mariana Islands, so his name for it was restored. This means that instead of regarding it as a pest to be disposed of, we should treasure and protect it just as we do the endemic cocoa bird. On this trip we were not lucky enough to see a monitor lizard, but we had seen one here on a previous trip, and I had grabbed this video with my cell phone. Can't tell you how many times you walk by them and they're hanging right on a branch right above you and you don't see them because they're not moving. Movement is what catches your eye. If that one didn't move, all of us would have walked right by it and not I noticed it at all. We come finally to the nature center, where the main exhibit is a set of dioramas of environments in ancient Chamorro times, along with recordings of bird songs that could be heard before the brown tree snake and other factors wiped out the native bird community on Guam. In the center is a display showing some of the birds that were lost with buttons to push to hear their calls. The National Wildlife Refuge is a small piece of land actually owned by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the green part on this map, but a much larger area is known as the Refuge Overlay, and this is an agreement primarily between the federal government and the Department of Defense, under which the Navy and Air Force committed to do their best to protect endangered species and species habitat on their lands. Hence, we see these large blue areas on the map over Anderson Air Force Base in the north and naval installations in the south. One of the big environmental concerns with the build-up is that DOD has decided, on the grounds of national security, which overrides the agreement, that they need live ammunition training ranges on Guam, both for relatively small weapons like machine guns on up to artillery. Public outcry got them to move their plans from the target area, but as a result they settled on Rotidian, which, while not marked for destruction because the shells are supposed to land in the Rota Channel, it looked like the refuge would be all but shut down until the recent agreement resolved it. 
Here are a few stills from an actual field trip a couple of years back when the park ranger showed us an ancient molar that had recently been found. When things are safe again, we'll reopen so everyone can enjoy. Um, and hopefully get more, get some exercise, get fresh air. We know that's healthy for everybody. And um, so at least there's spaces to go on nature trails as well as to go to the beach. The refuge is now open 7.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Wednesday through Sunday. After leaving Marybelle and starting to drive back, we stopped to look at the snake-proof fence that had been built here as an attempt to keep snakes out of an area near the gate. It's called an exclosure. The reason for the curious bulge is that it forced the climbing snakes to lean back and fall off the fence. The design was successful, but it was not maintained after its utility was demonstrated. Instead, there is now an area at the start of Route 3 near Potts Junction, where there is continuing snake research by the U.S. Geological Survey. That's it from Chris Lobin and Maria Schefter. We hope you will go enjoy the refuge now that it is open again.